Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining our OBA RPF Community Practice Webinar Series. My name is Ara Tukmakian. I'm a Senior Infrastructure Specialist at Global Partnership on Output-Based Aid. I've worked in the bank for 15 years in infrastructure sectors and joined GPOBA, where we explore result-based financing approaches and pilot OBA projects to support poor people in accessing basic services. A uh, global partnership on output-based aid launched a webinar series uh, to introduce innovative financing mechanisms that contribute to development solutions. We focus on RBF in particular, which has emerged as an important tool for financing basic services because it changes the focus from inputs, funding given in advance for expected results, to verified outputs. As a center of expertise for RBF, uh, this webinar series is one way in which GPOBA brings together different practitioners and development partners to share results, experiences, and lessons in RBF. Um, today we will speak about output-based aid in urban transport, and we've invited our colleague from Banks Transport and ICT Global Practice to share with us their experience in designing and implementing urban transport projects. Joining us here is Alejandro Ojos Guerrero, who's a transport specialist in the bank's transport and ICT global practice. He supports urban transport projects, mainly in Latin America and Caribbean region. Uh, joined the bank in 2012, and since then is passionate about how to maximize sustainability and impact of transport projects. Before we move on to our presentation, uh, just to remind you that we have reserved some time for questions and answers right after the presentation. You can type your questions, comments um, during presentation in the chat box located at the right of your screen, and we will make sure that these questions will be addressed during the Q&A session. Alejandro, please. Thank you, Sarah. My name is Alejandro Hoyos, and I'm a transport specialist uh, working in the global practice for transport and ICT. And uh, in today's presentation, I have three main objectives. The first one is to try to keep you off from your email, from social media, and, and from the news, and everything that can distract you as far as possible. The second is to transfer you the, the knowledge that we, that we gather when trying to figure out how to apply OBA for urban transport. And the third one, because I am a, a, a very operational person, I, I want things happening. I want to be very honest with you. This is an open question, and there has been no application of OBA in urban transport so far. So hopefully, this contributes to a future application of result-based financing, and especially OBA in urban transport. In today's presentation, the, we are first providing a, a brief uh, framework of what is result-based financing and what is OBA. Then I want you to make some reflection on what are the challenges for applying OBA for urban transport and why it's probably not being applied so far. Then we will present you how we propose to conceptualize possible pilots and possible applications of OBA. And finally, we want to highlight the important roles of first intelligent transport systems and then transport integration for application of OBA in urban transport. And of course, we will finalize with some conclusions and takeaway messages. So let's start from the beginning and provide this framework for result-based financing. Probably all of you are familiar with that, but traditional financing, as Sarah mentioned, is focusing on financing inputs at the right time. When you need the money, when you start implementation, the financing source will be available. Result-based financing, it's a little bit tricky because they, they ask you to have, to have to prove that the outputs are already there, the outcomes are already there, so you need to have a pre-financing mechanism to finance the intervention, and then result based financing will finance it retroactively. So there are some examples of application of result based financing. Even in transport, the most known is the clean development mechanisms out of the Kyoto Protocol. They will fund, they will fund projects when they have achieved a reduction of CO2 emission, when they are, when they are, proving, when they are proving the savings. We have also, in other sectors, conditional cash transfers, when you change your behavior, when you start uh, taking your kids to school or when you start going to the hospital, you will receive the cash transfer or program for results, which is uh, an instrument of the World Bank that defines adult some results towards they will find out. GPOBA doesn't focus on, well, focus on outcomes and they define outcomes, but the disburden will, will, will happen when the output is provided, not when the outcome is provided as in the CDM scheme. So 
the other the the other the other main focus of OBA that they make it different from other research RBF uh, RBF mechanisms is the objective, and it's in, the objective is to increase poor people access to basic infrastructure and services. I am providing an example of typical OBA intervention that helped me a lot to understand and 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 to frame how how could we apply OBA to urban transport. We usually will have a private service provider, and usually this will be formalized big private firm providing services like a water or electricity. And we will have poor people living in houses and that won't have access to this service, usually because connecting this house to the system will not be profitable or financially or financially sustainable. So what is OBA doing? OBA will be financing this infrastructure needed to link the house to the system so they can start using the service. And when is OBA dispersing? OBA will be dispersing when the poor people is actually using and usually paying for the service. When they have an independent verification agent will be there to check that they are paying the bill for the water or the, or the light. And then OBA will refund to the private, to the private service provider the, the initial investment they undertook for the for for the project. Another very important characteristic from OBA is the six core principles. The first one is proper targeting. OBA will always target the poor and create this incentive for the private service provider to 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 provide access to the to the service. The second one is accountability. The one responsible for providing the service and taking the initial financial risk is the private sector provider. If they don't get to provide the output, then they won't get the financing. Then another core principle is innovation. Usually, the, it's, there, is not an, there is not an obvious way to provide the service or to provide the access. The one that has to innovate is the service provider. The other three principles, the first one is efficiency. If the cost of providing this access to the service is too high, then OBA won't intervene. We have to prove some cost efficiency of the intervention. Then sustainability. Uh, it's not, I mean, OBA won't finance uh, an intervention that, the, that requires further subsidies in the future to be, to, be, to be sustainable. If the intervention is not sustainable, OBA won't intervene. And finally, the principle of output verification and monitoring will require an independent third party verifying that the outputs are there to, to, to allow the disbursement to happen. So with this, with this map in mind, I, I ask you, or I will present you the main challenges for urban transport. I am giving you questions here, not answers. Answers will come later, but I think it's important to place this question in, in, in your side to, 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 better, to better follow the answers. And the questions are regarding both to the principles and the components. We have to ask ourselves, in the, in the typical urban transport project, who is the public, who is the, the service provider? Is it always private? Is it always large and formalized? Then we have to try to understand what will be the equivalent to the infrastructure going or serving or serving the or serving the poor. Then what do we do with this? What are the poor? Where do, where do they not where do they live, but how can we identify the poor? And finally, how do we define the output? How do we define transport as a service to to undertake this investment? In terms of principle, proper targeting, how can we target the poor? Accountability, how can we measure the service provision and who will be responsible for covering the prefinancing? Who is this service provider that will cover the prefinancing? Innovation, who should be responsible for innovation? It's only the private sector or has the public sector also a role? And does the, the regulatory framework foster innovation? Then on efficiency, we have one of subsidies versus ongoing subsidies as in sustainability. So how can we reconcile the principle of like a one-off intervention with the fact, which is true in many countries, that urban transport system requires ongoing support from the public se sector. And finally, on output verification, how can we measure or verify an output that we haven't yet defined? So I want to highlight some very important questions out of all these questions that, uh, that uh, were an answer at the beginning. And the first, the, f the first more challenging question was how to identify the poor. In a, in a traditional OBA intervention, the house will serve as a, a, a proxy to identify the poor if they are not already identified. The materials with, with the house is, is constructed, or, the, or sometimes the area will serve as to 
say this is a poor uh, a poor customer and and we can provide the service to them but most of the transport users are not carrying the house to the to the bus so how can we identify them then on the service providers transport service providers they are not always private we have public service providers and sometimes they are atomized small owner operators we are not we don't have only one service provider but many and they are usually not very formalized and they have access to finance problems so institutions roles is more important in this in this kind of projects also the definition of responsibilities between the public sector the regulator or even the operator and the private sector is not always the same we have many many different schemes and finally how can we justify the recurrent subsidy Usually for urban transport, you, we justify the use, of, the use of subsidies because of ex externalities. People using urban transport are reducing congestion. When you reduce congestion, you are reducing pollution, you are increasing, you are increasing productivity. So everybody is benefiting from a, person using, from a person using urban transport, and that's justify the use of ex externalities. There is also a, a technical justification from a cost efficiency point of view called the Mooring effect meaning that when you when you subsidize urban transport and you increase the supply this increase in supply will 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 make a scale economies that will that will make the system more efficient then should we just who should we provide subsidies to supply or demand usually from an economic point of view is better to supply to to provide subsidies for demand because you are not distorting the system so the the market so much but sometimes subsidizing supply might be used and finally, and this is one of the most challenging questions, how can we bridge the disconnect between one of subsidies, one of disbursement providing with the, from OBA, and the need to and the need to reconcile or the need to the need to reconcile it with long term needs from the systems from a sustainability perspective. And finally, what is the output? How can we measure and verify it? And also this difference between the one of contribution, if we are we are usually thinking on an output that will be there versus the consideration of transport as a service that will not be like an infrastructure intervention always maybe something that is longer in time how can we reconcile that so this take us to the next step in the in the presentation which is the conceptualization of pilots in which we provide a framework and we try to start providing answers to all these questions and the first step to start conceptualizing pilots is defining barriers to the poor mobility from an output point of view. We are not talking yet about accessibility or, or what are we trying to achieve with transport. We are talking about what can prevent a poor person from using transport services. And the first and most obvious is price. If the system or the service is not affordable, poor people cannot use it, so they don't have access to transport. The second is supply. Maybe they can afford it, but in their neighborhood, they don't have any, any bus lines, they, they, then they obviously cannot access the system. And the final is quality in several dimensions. Maybe the, the, the buses are overcrowded, and this represents specific, special barriers for, for women, carrying children, for disabled people, and general barriers to everybody because the system has to be comfortable. System can, can be unreliable. And with an unreliable system, you can prefer other modes or you can stop traveling because you don't know if the system, if the bus will be available in the next five or in minutes or in the next hours. So we try to focus all the, all the outputs or all the pilots in removing these barriers to, to the poor mobility. Now let's start answering some questions. How can we target the poor when we are talking about urban transport? We have three ways of targeting the poor. The first way is individual targeting. Yes, the poor are not carrying with them the houses, but they are carrying their identities. So if we can identify them when they when they board the bus, and if we keep databases, then we can we can we can target the poor with, for instance, a supply subsidies proper targeted system. That can be done several ways. One is providing them with a with a with a with a photo with a with a photo with a photo ID, but usually this will this will this will imply a lot of a lot of evasion and a lot of fraud. So the best way to foster or to or to implement individual targeting would be electronic fare collection systems linked to a database and usually using other social systems as a proxy to identify who is poor. 
but this is not always available. And even when it's available, it's only available for some very formalized modes, and it's not available for the rest of the system. When this is not available, we can think about other ways of targeting the poor, for instance, geographically. Usually, you will have poorer neighbors, so you can target to improve the quality or the, or the, or the supply, or even to subsidize the services to these specific areas where the poor are. By improving these services, you are targeting the poor. And finally, modal targeting. In some cities, only the poor will use a specific mode. In other cities, only the poor will use public transport. I'll give you an example. I was in South Africa one month ago, and we had to work with the minibus taxi industry. Minibuses are quite nice vans. They carry like 10, 12 people, and they are responsible for moving two thirds of uh, total public transport trips in the, in the country. We want to find ways to improve in these systems, so we were on mission. And during the weekend, I got in this GO train, which is a very fancy suburban train to visit one neighborhood. And I wanted to get on a minibus taxi on my way back. So I started, I was with a colleague, I started asking people in the train, which were like a middle class people, hey, do you know any minibus route that can take me back? Or how can I, how can I get on the minibus? And everybody was looking at me as if I was crazy. Why would you do that? This is so dangerous. We don't do that. It's only the very poor people that do that. Well, actually, it's not the very poor people. It's the majority of people doing that. But there was, I mean, in their mind, it was impossible that someone that wasn't super poor will use these modes. So in some systems, when you are targeting a specific mode, or even when you are targeting public transport, you are targeting the poor. You don't need to go to individual targeting for that. Then output verification, and here you you know we have to link the disbursements so to some to some to some outputs. So in the report, actually I forgot to introduce the the report. All this is it's coming from a report that the GPUBA funded to find ways to use OPA in urban transport. And in the report, the we identified these the following the following possible indicators categorized in five categories. First, embedment output. For instance, OPA could start disbursement if we are improving bus stops to make the system more accessible from physical accessibility point of view, or if we are if we are improving non-motorized infrastructure to better access the system, or if they if we are implementing a new ticketing system that will enable like a, a, a proper targeted system. When this investment is available, then OPA will disburse. This is more traditional and more and more similar to what OBA in other sectors are doing. Other category of possible indicators will be production outputs, transport production. We are talking about vehicle kilometer produces, seat kilometers available during the peak hours, number of lines going through specific areas, maintaining appropriate frequencies or reliability. You see, we are talking the first two will be supply, increasing the supply, the second two will be, well, the third will be increasing the supply and the quality of service, and the last one will be increasing the, the quality of service. Then fair incentives. If we are enabling a, 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 a subsidy, whether it's general subsidy or it's targeted to the poor, we can we can measure ridership of the system and see if it increases. We can measure passenger kilometers, which is other way of, of, of measuring demand, or we can measure how many people are subscribing to the system. Then another category, and this is an, a financial innovation that uh, many cities are considering, will be uh, using OBA to enabling leasing schemes for fleet provision. We have in other sectors, like in train, in, in, in rail, the Roscos, or in a, um, or the same in, air, in airplanes, that you have one provider for the fleet that will own the fleet. That can be a private provider, or that can be the public sector owning the fleet, and then leasing the buses or the vehicles to the private operators. Private operators usually don't have access to finance, so this is a way to increase to increase to increase the renovation rate of the fleet or to increase the, the, the number of vehicles available. What, uh, what OBA will do there will be funding an initial revolving fund to guarantee these leasing contracts. And, and what we will measure will be the number of leasing contracts signed. Then capacity strengthening will be the last category for output verification. Capacity strengthening should be always an integral part of OBA projects, and we will measure that by effort. Now, the third important, important aspect I, I, I think we, th we have to consider 
is the importance of the context that will shape what can we do and what can we don't. And we identified in the report three different, like this matrix represents first three different types of operators. The operators can be private and small, atomized or small associations or owner operators. We can have one or several private large operators, or we can have a public large operator. And we can have different contexts. Unregulated, like uh, the authorities will be providing providing permits or, or, or defining routes uh, or even reacting to, to routes predefined. And there will be no performance indicators. There will be no hard monitoring, just some maybe technical regulation in the best cases and, and annual checks in the best cases. Then we have regulated services with no subsidies. In, it will be a concession that is uh, that is now including an operation uh, an operational plan, and it's including some performance indicators, and it's monitoring the performance from the from the from the private concessioner, the private service provider, and then regulated system, but applying subsidies. So this take us, and I don't want to lose you with this table because it's too much information. You can go to the report, but the main message here is that depending on the context, depending on the targeting strategy, depending on who are we providing the subsidy to, we will have different types of interventions. We will have different disbursement link in the in link indicators, and we will have different ways to justify sustainability. And now. Uh, I want to I want to I want to include or I want to challenge what we did less than one year ago, <laughs> but the things are changing so fast and and I think it's worth it to do it. As you can see in scenarios one and three, we were saying that if there is no regulation in the system, we cannot apply OBA. One and three, it's uh, uh, this is this is something that uh, as I will show you before, may not be necessarily true because of ITS and, and innovation in, in public transport systems, we can find some, 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 some alternatives. And then in scenario two, the targeting, the report says, can only be modern, cannot be geographic, or cannot, cannot be individual. Actually, a scenario two will be a scenarios one and two in the, the private, the small operations, is what we will likely find in most of the in most of the IDA or developing countries that GPOBA is working in, and in, in most even in middle income countries, one and two is the conventional bus system will be the minibus taxi industry will be paratransit services. This is scenarios one and two are serving the majority of the poor needs, and we were actually restricting the use of OBA to model targeting when there is some sort of regulation and say no OBA when there was no regulation. So the next part of the presentation is showing some, in, some innovation that can widen the scope for the application of OBA to urban transport. And it's a role of ITS and the importance of transport integration. So first innovation in, with ITS that we can use to challenge this, this, this limitation of the scope of the application. We have some apps that let us now uh, start mapping informal buses routes. This has been done in Cape Town, in Mexico City, in, in, in El Cairo, in many cities. That will allow not only to start thinking on geographic targeting, because before we, did, we were not sure where the informal routes were, but also to improve the planning of the system and increase the efficiency of the system. OPA could be enabling the, the, the implementation of these of this kind of mapping, and there will be basis to say we are targeting the pool, we are improving the systems, or we could use that to design an OBA intervention. Booking first and mobile payment is not only a fair card, because when we are talking about uh, small operators, we, th we thought, well, usually they don't have the equipment for electronic payments, but now you see in Nairobi they are paying with SMS. And SMS are linked to a phone account, so you can actually identify who is paying. There is room for individual targeting. There is room also for measuring results and for measuring ridership of the poor. <coughs> now, there are also some applications that let you like let you rate your driver or your vehicle. So you can so the drivers will start having a rating and the market will be able to expel bad drivers, so people will be will be selecting the best drivers. This will increase the quality of service, one of the barriers that we identify for the poor. Again, OBA can foster this kind of interventions. 
And finally, the smart cards and integrating first, and that's something more traditional to say in some way. It, uh, it allows us to, to implement targeted subsidy schemes and also help operator access financing because they will have a more certain cash flow to show their financiers. So to recapitulate on integrated transport system, it has an importance for proper targeting. It is widening how well can we target the poor, especially with paratransit services. It is important for output verification and monitoring because we will have data on how the poor are, are using transport. It is also important for measuring results in terms, for instance, of accessibility. We can see that, we will see that later in the presentation. It is important for planning because you will have more information so you can plan better. And it is also important to increase the level of service, like uh, the application I was showing before about freighting, freighting drivers. Now, ITS and the fare collection systems and so on are enabling or facilitating transport integration. And I want to refer to transport integration because it has a lot of benefits, especially for the poor. So there are three dimensions on transport integration. We usually talk about physical integration, which means having integrated um, inter intermodal stations in which you can get off the bus and you can ride the metro seamlessly without going, without walking too much and without going through, through many hassles in the street. Then operational integration, which means planning together all the modes meaning that the planner will take into account when you are getting off the bus so you don't have to wait too much for the metro for instance and you have like a, a station that are interchanging in, in convenient places and you are minimizing the total trip length and then financial integrations you want to pay only for one trip you don't want to pay every leg of the trip and this is especially important for the poor so integrated planning itself it maximizes the benefits of the system and minimize costs make the system more efficient and also have potential benefits for, for the poor because the poor are usually living in the periphery of the city. So they have to transfer more. They have to, to make longer trips. And if you can provide them with a single fare or with a, or with a fare system that is, that is not penalizing or even in subsidizing longer trips, then the poor will be better off. However, I want to show you now what happened, what happened in Bogota with the SATP to show that it's not only about integration, but about getting it right. So in Bogota, they had this Transmilenio world-class BRT system. It was an example in the world of the potential of the, of the BRT in the cities. And then they have the conventional buses. And the government tried to integrate the conventional buses through the creation of the SITP. The conventional buses was in the middle of this penny war, small operators, owner operators, a small, a small group of companies. They, they foster the creation of companies, they agglomerate of these operators, they also improve the contractualization of services, they, they started doing some integrated planning and regulation. And they, of course, implemented also a fair collection system in the, in the, in the new buses, etc. So this was Bogota before, with all the penny wars, oversupply, lack of, lack of quality of service, a lot of problems in terms of safety, and this was Bogota like a brand new buses, electronic collection system, and everybody happy. Well, many of the elements of the reform were very good in internalizing externalities and work really good. Bus scrapping, new buses, more safety, formal, employing, formal employment. But from the user's point of view, some of the elements were also like a bothering. They wanted to use cash. They had to, they, there was not enough there were not enough points to recharge the, the electronic uh, the electronic cards to pay for the system. They have to wait longer into, for the buses because the system was more efficient, so they reduce oversupply that reduced frequency. They have to ride longer routes, and they couldn't they couldn't get on a bus wherever they had the specific bus stops. It was also causing some burden for the administration because the the, the demand estimation was higher than expected. So two two operators were background and. The system is receiving subsidies. Now I want to introduce the concept of accessibility and affordability because that's a, that's an important thing we have to think about when we are when we are designing these kind of projects. Accessibility we can define it as one person, how many jobs, how many economic opportunities, how many how many social opportunities in terms of education, health, he can access within the transport system. So we can measure it by saying within one hour of travel how many opportunities this person can access. And we have to include a second layer, which is affordability. 
it doesn't matter if he has a metro that will take him uh, in one hour to the job if he cannot pay for the metro. So we restrict the number of opportunities, capping also the, the expenditure. And this is what we should target in every transport project focusing the poor, because this is what we are, that we, what we, what, why we are working in transport for, to increase accessibility from the poor to the, to the, to the opportunities. And in fact, the story in Bogota is not so good in terms of accessibility. These maps are tricky, but I will try to explain them. The first map is uh, it's in 2011, and the second represents the situation with the SATP implemented. You see more, more black lines with corresponds to BRT corridors, and accessibility improved due to the BRT corridors, because they have exclusive lane, you have a lot of time savings. But for the SATP, Accessibility improved slightly, like uh, almost nothing in the city center, and actually was reduced in some of the poorest area. You remember most of the poor live in the periphery. If you go to the south in the map on the on the right, you will see, I mean, green is bad, red is good. You will see less red in the south part, meaning that the poor people living in this poor area, they were they were they had less accessible opportunities after the implementation of the SATP. So that's a lesson that we have to keep in mind when 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 designing these kind of operations. And we are getting to the to the end of the of the presentation and I want to give you some takeaways. These are my, my picks but you can fix others of course. And the first takeaway is that we have to take into account urban transport specific features when planning OPA. Urban transport is not like uh, other sectors like water or energy. It's not OBA taking the system or the, the service to the people. It's the people accessing the service. It's not making a pipe to let the water arrive to the house. It's removing barriers to let the house dweller arrive to the or get uh, or get to the service. And all these services are or nobody transport with no reason. Or travel has a purpose. So you have to check also when planning. That, the, that actually you are, you are actually improving accessibility. Then project designs and structure will be highly dependent on the context. We should not, we should not limit our, the application of OPA to one specific intervention, to enabling for poor subsidies or to paying for bus stations or for fleet renovation. Actually, this is a sector that is also, that has a, has a lot of political implications. So you have to look not only for not only not only have an open mind to for 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 different types of of of, of interventions, but also to keep in mind that you want to you want to 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 support something that is feasible, technically feasible, economically feasible, but also politically feasible. What do you want to put your your support in? The third one is that ITS has the potential to be a game changer and broaden the scope of the application of OBA approaches. And you can actually be enabling the, enabling the application of ITS. You can also use ITS to design better OPA for urban transport. And finally, independently of the approach of the project or the outcome, the, the output you are supporting, you should never forget the outcome, which is to remove barriers to transport and increase accessibility for the poor. So we got to the end and now ready for questions. Thank you, Alejandro, for this very interesting and thought-provoking presentation. It's now time for questions. Uh, let me read them out one at a time for you to answer. Um, we have received quite a few. Of all the challenges to apply OBA to urban transport, what would you say is the most relevant? That's the first question. So probably the thing that, that, uh, that cost us the most time to, to come with was this disconnect between OPA was usually one of one of disbursement right. and very specific disbursement for infrastructure and then we, we had like an ongoing recurrent need of subsidies. The usual when, when we were talking about subsidizing the access for the poor, the usual mind, mindset is let's let's subsidize the 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 the, fair, the, fair, the tickets. Let's subsidize right. but this isn't something that has to be ongoing, so OBA wasn't providing for that. And the answer we got for that, let's think of OBA as an enabler. Like uh, OBA shouldn't be funding the actual subsidy, but maybe enabling an increase of the service, an increase of the quantity, 
and the implementation of the subsidy scheme and so on. And this is what we are proposing here. Excellent. Uh, thank you. Now, the next question um, is, um, you mentioned access to finance of the service providers as a challenge. Um, please elaborate. What What is the main challenge? What do you mean by saying that it's a, there's a difficulty in this area? So most of the countries we work in are at this context, you remember the one and two, that we have a small operators, uh, usually poorly regulated, atomized. And uh, what we find in all the countries is that they have actually no access to finance. The projects are not bankable, even when they are transformed. Some of them, if they are lucky, they will access some local, 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 local banks providing them very expensive financing. Most of them will be relying, and I'm talking about my experience in Mexico, but yeah. this is something that is happening elsewhere. Most of them are relying on the manufacturers, providing them with uh, with financing because the manufacturers have no other way to, to sell the passes. So there is a way I think OBA can also break this cycle, and it's enabling access to finance. How can we enable access to finance? Mm -hmm. We can first try to try to foster project structures that are bankable, so the operators do not need to they they are not they 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 are not setting the risk of the of the financial operation but the project will in investing or trying to foster project or, or project financing like approach then there are other interventions that can increase or can reduce the level of risk or can increase access to finance like a fair collection systems usually you are reducing financial management problems you are reducing innovation so you are reducing the risk or many other methods that you can apply to reduce the matrix for the operators. Thank you. Um, can you elaborate efficiency and sustainability principles and how to reconcile this with the need for recurrent subsidies? I think you talked about this in your presentation, but it would yeah. be good to... It was one of the questions, yeah. but it didn't have an answer. All right. So we have a trade-off in, in all projects between provision of, of service of quality and efficiency in achieving our objectives, and then the fiscal sustainability. So if we want to provide the service to the poor, then we have to subsidize, so then we have to improve the system, but this will be too expensive for the for the countries. And we have to play with this trade-off. In terms of efficiency, I would say, unlike other sectors, like energy, especially for renewable energy, uh, urban transport projects are have high social return. We usually don't have any problem on justifying economic uh, economic efficiency, cost efficiency. In terms of sustainability, I I think when when we are talking about subsidies, we have to ensure that uh, well, many people will say or, or we will say we don't want to be putting water water on a leaking bucket. So usually with subsidies, you have two main problems: exclusion and inclusion. Exclusion when you are not in, when you are not providing the subsidy to the to the to the poor, so you are setting up a subsidy scheme and then you are not using it. And inclusion when you are subsidizing people that are not entitled to to get the subsidy. So I think all the ITS interventions are very good to reduce exclusion and inclusion errors that will increase sustainability. Then also a proper targeting allow us to focus the subsidy on the people who are who really need it. So we can actually increase the general first and then focus the subsidy on the poor. So the system will be making more money and the poor will get more access. And then, and that's a personal opinion. I have heard so many times, uh, not only because of the subsidies, but in general, systems are not efficient. The operators are not providing a good service. They are spending too much money in the operation. We cannot afford a subsidy to this system. But in the end, is the poor people paying for the or being being damaged for the for, for something that is not their fault? So even if it is still a leaking bucket, it's a leaking bucket who is taking the poor to their jobs. And I think, I mean, we can we, we should not aim for perfection in terms of in terms of sustainability. We should try to enforce what we can enforce, but we should prioritize providing the service to those who need it. Absolutely. Um, there is a, a request here to bring an example. I think we can to take the Bogota example and to illustrate how OBA would apply in design of the urban transport project. 
So, okay. The Bogota example first, uh, OBA actually financed a study for Bogota to set up the, to set up the, the, the or to help with the, with the, with a proper targeted subsidy system. Mm -hmm. So this is an example in which OBA helped, but it wasn't through OBA financing, it was through a, through a grant. And then I think Bogota is a good example for the open-minded message that I want to send here. OBA could have helped in many different ways. They could have helped improving the contractualization of the service or providing financing for structuring the, con the, the, the concessions or the contract for the, for the operators or even for the fair collection, for the fair collection operators. Mm -hmm. Then uh, these operators could have paid a Will have will, will have paid a success fee for the city and got reimbursed from OBA, for instance. OBA could have helped by financing the new buses, or by financing the scrapping processes. OBA could have financed the actual equipment for the buses and for the stations. Mm -hmm. The ways OBA could have could have the, the in terms of output is huge. Now, what I would what I would what I would have liked to see, or what I would like to see in the future, if OBA gets into these kind of projects. The second part that we presented in the presentation: How can we measure the that the poor are actually better off with the project? And I think this is an opportunity to highlight the importance of project preparation. When we jump in a project, we have to make a very true diagnosis of the system: where is better to invest the money, where is better, where is more feasible to to make the OPA contribution, but also how can we ensure that this output will actually generate the ambition outcome. Because unlike uh, energy or water, that if you are getting water in your house, you know these people will be better off. Transport is more complex. So OPA can also help, or could have also helped in the Bogota case mm -hmm. to ensure that the, that the final outcome will be having the poor better off. Uh, there is an interesting question here requesting you to elaborate about the PPP-based urban transport operations. PPP-based urban transport operations. Yeah. So that's a, that's a very interesting topic because we are always trying to apply PPP to urban transport, but there is not a single way to apply it. First, because uh, urban transport projects are modular. When we think of a, of a PPP project in any other sector, like uh, energy, you usually have a service, uh, an SPV, that will be providing the service and taking on the risk. In urban transport, we have different services. We have the infrastructure, mm -hmm. we have the buses, we have the stations, we have the fare collection, and you can combine them very differently. The usual way to go is the, because the revenue will never provide enough, the, the operating revenue will be, ne, will be usually not enough to cover the, the infrastructure. The usual way to go, what we see in Mexico, is the concessionaire will be the bus operator and will be responsible for providing the fleet. And then you can have a second concessionaire for the, that's also in, in Bogota, for the fair collection system. Now, there are, there are people challenging or trying to challenge these, these schemes because, for instance, the private operators, they don't have access to finance. So how can we improve their access to finance? One, one way is these leasing contracts that, we, that uh, we were talking about. They won't be held in responsible for providing the fleet. By not providing the fleet, you are, you are removing from them the need to provide in finance for the fleet. Someone with a with a better with a with a better access to finance will be financing the fleet. Mm -hmm. Plus, they are not. You don't have to justify longer concessions for because of the life of the vehicles. You can shorten the concession and have more rotations. PPP in urban transport is something that I think we can do five webinars about, and it's a very broad concept. But if I if I if I had to if I had to to say two things about PPP in urban transport, the first one is it's far more complex than other that other sectors because because of the different components and the different actors involved. It's also more risky because you don't have such a reputable service provider. You have sometimes small operators that are that are close to mafia and or with a very 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 little governance and very little governance capacity not always i'm generalizing but right. you can find that and 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 then you don't have very in intensive in capital deals or very huge revenue like uh, in other sectors so the deals will be will be small and small deals make 
find it difficult to attract private financing, especially with this level of complexity. A big investment bank, they won't be, they, it will be, it won't be so interested in getting involved in a in an urban transport project because of the level of risk and the small size of the deal. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we have a couple of more questions, but just to remind the audience that. Um, you can type your questions and comments uh, in the chat box located at the right of your screen. Uh, we will make sure that these questions are answered. Uh, so let me read out uh, the one that I see right here. Uh, in your view, is it worth exploring putting in place policies that make transport more attractive? Absolutely. And not only we, we have been talking in this, this webinar about the poor access to transport, mm -hmm. but uh, this is something going beyond the beyond the poor. This is something right. societies societies need, like from a from a from a CO2 emission reduction perspective, or even local emission reduction perspective. Many cities are struggling with that. Urban transport or public transport is is the only solution we know now, and making it more attractive is actually the 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 the. the the action that has the biggest potential for emission reduction. We were making some numbers the, 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 during, the, during the last two years on comparing fostering model shift, like fostering people letting the, letting the car at home and, and, jumping into, and jumping into the back to the bus with using hybrid and electric technologies. And we find that uh, if you achieve 10% of model shift, meaning that 10% of the bus riders own a car and are not using it because of the improved system mm -hmm. has the double the potential of making all the fleet electric, mm -hmm. for instance, which is huge. So, yes, we need policies to foster to to make it to make yeah. public but transport. Discourage uh, use of uh, private cars. Um, it's pull and push. Yes. 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 Many other other approaches. Um, there is a comment question. You've talked about mobility barriers um, in your presentation, and uh, it's clear that by identifying what the main barriers are uh, that prevent access of the poor from essential services, um, you, we can design successful urban transport projects that maximize pro-poor impact. So what are these mobility barriers exactly that you see as a hindrance to, to development? So the, the three mobility barriers uh, we identified was price, supply, and quality of service. In terms of price, they are usually like a, it's not always financially sustainable to, to, to provide bus transport services to the poor. Mm -hmm. And when it is, it's because the public, uh, the private operators are, are making the service worse, are maintaining less the buses, and, and are providing less quality of service. So the, the price barrier is pretty, is pretty like, uh, how to say that? Uh, it's a no-brainer. It's, it's obvious. Then in terms of access, there is a, there is, there is a huge range of, of measures or a huge range of barriers we can find. We can find that people cannot, cannot actually access the, the transport system. Well, the, the supply, the most obvious is if you don't have supply. But even if you have supply, Maybe the the system is placed in, in in somewhere you don't have enough infrastructure to guarantee a safe access. Then you have a lot of uh, barriers to not to vulnerable people, to disabled people, or even for women. Gender is a thing in terms of access. Not only because of, because of the infrastructure, like uh, you can provide more security or more safety, but putting more lights or security in the system. It's also, and I was talking to Carla Dominguez, the person in our unit uh, on gender about yesterday, mm -hmm. and she was telling me there are cultural there are cultural barriers to access transport. Many women they will not use public transport because of harassment, for instance. This is another kind of barriers to access transport. Then obvious barriers like infrastructure barriers for this for disabled people. And then when we are talking about quality of service, everybody deserves a good service. And if you are not providing a good service, you are not achieving the maximum potential of using of, of public transport. We are talking also about being comfortable, having a condition, having densities that are that are that are that are acceptable. That you will not have to be squeezed, but you have to balance the quality of service with the financial sustainability. That's all. Thank you. 
And um, the last question that I see is about sustainability aspects of the project. Um, how we ensure that interventions are actually helping the poor? I think we spoke about it a lot in the, in the presentation, but you may want to so give a brief answer. That's that's an that's actually an open question. And yeah. We don't we don't have like a strong answer to that. But the the answer I, I take from this presentation and the message we want to we want to send is technology. We have now technology that can that, that let us make analysis that uh, ten years ago will take a lot of time, a lot of efforts. Now we have mobile data, we have all these cool tools that, uh, that let us geo differentiate all the jobs, all the opportunities, and all, all this serves not only to monitor, but also to plan. Mm -hmm. So you want to monitor that you are achieving the outcomes, but you also want to intervene in the, during the design to use all this information to ensure that the design is actually making, making possible all these, all these outcomes. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I think we've exhausted all of the questions for now. Thank you all for attending this webinar. Uh, the presentation and the recording can be found on the Community of Practice website. Lastly, a reminder that, uh, uh, that this site, uh, you know, the Q&A discussion will continue on this website, the Community of Practice site. The site will give you an opportunity to co collaborate with the webinar presenters, the participants, as well as network with other RBF practitioners within the community. Um, you may have joined this site before the webinar started, but if you would like to continue the rich discussions or if your questions have not been answered yet, please click on the Community of Practice link that you see on your screens. Thank you very much.